Today, we want to talk about polar coordinates. This is something that comes up kind of often. We talk about polar coordinates back in trig. Maybe you talk about polar coordinates in pre-calculus. In Calc 1, you talk a little bit about polar coordinates. And in Calc 2, we talk a little bit about polar coordinates, mainly in doing things like finding arc length and whatnot. But now we're really gonna have to deal with polar coordinates in more detail. So all we have with polar coordinates is a different way of labeling two-dimensional space. It's just an alternate coordinate system that's really focused on round stuff. Like the solid we had yesterday, all the cross sections of that solid, actually all the horizontal cross sections of that solid were round. And we were stuck with these friggin' rectangular coordinates. To describe a circle, we have to say x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And that was kind of inconvenient. We couldn't write x as a function of y or y as a function of x. It was kind of a bummer. We worked through it. We grew as people. Everything worked out. It's fine. <clears throat> so what we want to do today is introduce an alternate coordinate system for round stuff. Knowing how to do things one way is essentially not knowing how to do things. That's, that's just facts. Like at your home, if you have emergency supplies, if you have one, you have none. If you have one flashlight in your house, you don't have a flashlight in your house. I know it's like, oh, well, there's a flashlight on my phone. Your phone flashlight is friggin' terrible. It's great for lighting things up like right in front of you. But next time you're in a dark room, turn on your phone flashlight and it lights up about three feet around you. It's just, it's just not very good. Plus, it's really inconvenient to hold a flashlight shaped this way, right? I mean, it's just like, it's, that's not how flashlights work. It's terrible. <clears throat> so knowing one is knowing none. Let's come up with a different system to describe two-dimensional space. Coordinate systems are just how we describe space. In this case, we're going to describe two-dimensional space with polar coordinates. All we need is a system and two uh, pieces of information. In rectangular coordinates, just like uh, addresses, we have an X and a Y coordinate, a horizontal and a vertical. So this address is 3300 College Drive. We have an X coordinate, 3300, and a Y coordinate, College Drive. Now, College Drive is kind of loopy and curvy, but you get the idea. We need two pieces of information to describe something in two-dimensional space. So there's another way to describe where that point is in space, and that's gonna be with polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, instead of having an X and Y axis, we set up the origin as a pole. And instead of measuring or, or labeling a point on the plane with two distances, we use one distance and an angle. So the coordinates of this point x, y in rectangular or Cartesian coordinates, it's the same location as r theta in polar coordinates. <clears throat> so r is the distance from the origin or the pole in this case to the point. And theta is the angle that a line connecting 
the origin and the point makes with the positive x axis. <clears throat> so R is the distance from the pole to the point. <clears throat> Excuse me. And theta is the angle that the line connecting the pole and the point makes with the positive x axis. So we do have to establish where our x and y axis our axes are going to be. All we're doing is coming up with a different way of labeling all the points on the XY plane. We want to be able to convert from rectangular to polar. So if we have rectangular coordinates, we want to be able to write that in polar coordinates. If we have polar coordinates, we want to be able to write rectangular coordinates. Because polar coordinates is going to be great for round stuff. It's not going to be great for not round stuff. Think about the stuff that rectangular coordinates are really good at. Polar coordinates are going to struggle. Think about the things that rectangular coordinates are very bad at, or that polar coordinates are very good at, that's where rectangular coordinates are going to struggle. Better to have pole. So we want to be able to switch from one to the other. And we can pull out this little triangle and see how they are related. So if we grab this triangle, X is gonna be this horizontal leg and Y is gonna be this vertical leg of a right triangle. And the hypotenuse will be R. That's by the lengths all the way around. And then theta will be the angle that the hypotenuse makes with the horizontal leg. Now we can clearly see how these values are related. X squared plus Y squared will equal R squared. So we could say that R is plus or minus the square root of x squared plus y squared. There's no r that we uh, write with a negative that we can't write with a positive. Just move your theta 180 degrees or pi radians. So we can just worry about the positive one. And the tangent of theta is y over x. So that's a relationship between theta and x and y. Tangent of theta. is y over x. So if we needed theta itself, we could just inverse tangent both sides. But then we have to remind ourselves that inverse tangent 
only applies to a certain value, certain bunch of values of theta. So we're going to have to make sure that we get the right um, quadrants. So we're going to have to be careful if our x y point is in the second or third quadrant, because inverse tangent is going to spit back values in the first or fourth quadrant. if you use tangent inverse. If you start using the inverse tangent function, remember that inverse tangent has a range of negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So that's limiting you to the first and the fourth quadrant. So make sure you check your x, y, that you're not in the second or third quadrant. Check your quadrants. Now here's how we can get r and theta. If we have x and y, we can do this uh, similar thing. If we have x and y and we want uh, or if we have r and theta and we want x and y. And this kind of goes back to our dot product discussion. So notice that x and y are, if we think of vectors, are just the horizontal and vertical components of r at an angle of theta. So we can say that x is r times the cosine of theta. and y is r sine theta. So we can use x and y to find r and theta, or we can use r and theta to find x and y. We can translate back and forth. The one thing that we'll have to be careful about is our quadrants. When we use tangent inverse. Any questions? How's everybody okay? Everybody looks like stunned. Is it like mid-semester slump? I don't know about y'all, but halfway through the semester, week seven feels like a decline. Week eight, nine, and 10 are just really rough. I don't know about you, but they're really rough on me. I don't even know why. It's just always been this way. It's a mid-semester slump. It's the Wednesday of the semester. So the semesters are 17 weeks long. Some places, the semester is only 15 weeks long. And so like right around eight, nine, and 10, weeks, uh, or yeah, weeks eight, nine, and 10 are kind of a low point for me. This was true as a student as well. Like eight, nine, and 10, that is when I was gonna be struggling the most during the semester. But then when I transferred, uh, when I transferred to finish up my bachelor's degree, I thought, well, I'm transferring to a school on the quarter system. Quarters are only 11 weeks long. So on one hand, right about the time things are getting struggle, well, I'll be done. On that same hand, right about the time when I normally struggle is when finals show up. So that kind of sucks. But then I realized it's not the amount of time. It's the fact that this is the middle. And instead of hitting a slump, eight, nine, and 10, like middle of the semester, I just hit a slump earlier in four, five, and six. So I was like, week four, I'm like, oh, this sucks. And then week five and six were like all real struggle. I'm like, oh, 
the depression just happens in the middle of the semester, no matter how long it is. So if I took a week long course, Wednesday would suck. If it was two weeks long, that would ruin a weekend. That's just, that's apparently just how it's gonna be. It's the middle that's sad. Anyway, I don't know if y'all are like that. Do you even notice these things about yourself as a student? Because you should pay attention to these kinds of things about yourself as a student. The reason I bring this up is that most of the time students be lying to themselves. And we've had this conversation before, but it bears repeating. A lot of times students will lie to themselves. They'll say things like, I work better under pressure. That's a lie. I don't care what you actually believe about yourself. You do not work better under pressure. You're just trying to give yourself an excuse to procrastinate. That is it. I shit you not, if you just started writing the paper today, instead of a month from now, the paper will come out better. But you don't want to. That's why you want to believe that you work better under pressure. Every time you find yourself thinking, I work better under pressure, whenever that thought occurs to you, you have to stop immediately and think, wait a second, what am I putting off? What is it that I should do now that I clearly don't want to do? Why am I giving myself this excuse? Does that make sense? I don't even know what that thing is going to be. And I don't care how hard you believe about yourself that you work better under pressure. Because the fact is, anything that you believe, the more you believe it, the more you need to question it. Does that make sense? Everything that you believe, the more you believe it, the harder you need to question it. Because if your beliefs don't stand up to questioning, you probably don't really believe those things. Does that make sense? And if you don't question it, you're just kind of afraid to question your beliefs because you have doubts. This is important because y'all are going into science and in science, you gotta be willing to be wrong. You don't just get to believe stuff and make it manifest. You don't get to believe that all numbers are rational because there are rational numbers. You don't get to go murdering people just because they prove to you that there are irrational numbers and you really want to believe that all numbers are rational. I don't even know if that story is true, but it's a lot from a long, long time ago. The Pythagoreans being in a cult believed that all numbers were rational. One of them comes along and say, check it out. All numbers are not rational and I can prove it. And then he proves it and then they kill him because they wanted to believe something and they weren't willing to question it. What a bunch of idiots. Go around naming shit after themselves that they didn't come up with. Any ghosts of Pythagoreans around, if you're offended, well, maybe you should be. So suck it, Pythagoreans. All murdering people. They're like, all, they're like ghosts are like, oh, dude, that's not true. We clearly came around. It's like, oh, you clearly didn't. Naming stuff after yourself. So, well, yeah, we did steal that. We totally stole that. Because that was a, this is an old result. Anyway. What are we talking about? Oh, yes. We don't work better under pressure. Middle of the semester is kind of a slump. I don't know if you've analyzed your patterns as a student. When do you start putting stuff off? When does your motivation fall off? Because motivation is a dick and it fails on you when you need it the most. Never rely on motivation. All right. So what we want to be able to do is look at functions and describe them, not, as, not in terms of uh, X and Y, but we're gonna to try to describe functions in terms of R and theta. 
So think about the function we had yesterday. Did I use nine or four? Nine? Yeah, because of all the twos, that makes sense. So here's what the function looks like in rectangular coordinates. And it very clearly has this round aspect to it because this minus x squared minus y squared and secretly, this is just after the distributive property, nine minus this circle. So what we can do is replace our x squared plus y squared with an r squared, and now we have a function in polar coordinates. This is the same thing what would have happened if we didn't notice that we could factor out the negative one and just replaced our x squared and y squared or our x and y with r cosine theta and r sine theta. So the other way around this is to take nine minus x squared minus y squared and replace the x with r cosine theta and the y with r sine theta. I'll have space to square the R and then halfway through, I decided I wanna have the squares on the outside to remind ourselves where the R squared and the cosine squared are coming from. So I have R cosine theta, all that being squared. So it's gonna be nine minus R squared cosine squared theta. Similarly, r sine theta, all that squared, is going to be r squared times sine squared theta. Pens are a little bit beefy to do the double pen hold. Now we realize like, oh, I should have just factored out the negative one and subtracted the x squared plus y squared because now I see a common factor of r squared in the second two terms. So I have nine minus r squared times cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. The double pen hold became untenable, so I had to go printing press style. Oops. I factored a minus r squared out, so that leaves a plus r us plus in here. I'll highlight it with red. And we know the cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. Is it cheating to set this up with? the Pythagorean theorem, and then use this Pythagorean identity later on. I mean, if you know one, the other one, they, they just kind of go together. It's kind of using the same thing. It's like when people say, I don't like completing the square or use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula comes from completing the square. So you do like the, completing the square if you like the quadratic formula. Incidentally, if you like the quadratic formula, that's incorrect. The quadratic formula is trash. But anyway. Thank you, Pythagorean identity. I would thank Pythagoras, but you definitely didn't come up with this stuff, especially the way that we write it.
One thing to note about our nine minus r squared is that theta doesn't appear. It's like, oh, I thought you said this was gonna be a function of r and theta. But we know that when a variable doesn't appear in our equation, it's because everything, it looks the same. It looks like nine minus r squared doesn't matter the value of theta. When a variable doesn't appear in your function, that means that variable doesn't matter to the function. So if theta does not appear, but this is still information. It says it doesn't matter. That means it doesn't matter the value of theta. We just need the nine minus R squared. It's like in Wordle, if your first guess, you get no information, you got five information. That first guess in Wordle always pays off with five information. If you get no yellow or green squares, that means you know five letters that are not in the word you're looking for. And that's good information. That makes sense. So the hardest letter, hardest words in Wordle are the ones with doubles because you don't want to double up on a letter because of all, what if I don't get information based on that? Even though you'll find out whether there are or aren't double letters, you always get information. Anybody play Wordle? Or did that just do Am I like the only person in the room that plays Wordle? All I need is one person to do Wordle so they know what the F I'm talking about. It's like when I'm talking about like guitars or something like that. If like nobody in the room except me plays guitars, like the reference, but it's like one person. It's like D and D. I'll reference D and D all the time. All I need is one person to understand the D and D reference. And then there will be D&D &D references for the rest of the semester. I just need one. They don't even need to be here on a particular day. I just need to know that there is one. So the theta does not appear in our function, but that just means that it's the same for all values of theta. Our function is the same for all values of theta. And so we're always just getting this circle nine minus R squared for all values of theta. So taking theta out is going to be how we make a circle. If there's no theta, then our, our graph is just going to be r equals some constant. And so we get this circle, which is perfect because that's how we define a circle in the first place. It's everything that's, this, that's one distance away from the center. That's how we define circles. Everything radius units away from the center of our circle. We've actually seen this before. With in two dimensions, it doesn't get very interesting. I don't know, maybe th this is not uh, very interesting either, but it 
if x equals some constant, we get a vertical line. We get the same thing for all values of y. X is some constant for all the values of Y. That's why it goes vertical, because we don't care about the Y. It's always the same for all the Y values. Similarly, when we write Y equals some constants, we get a horizontal line. We just get this value for all the different values of X. So what does this have to do with integrals? We want to be able to describe regions in polar coordinates as well. So let's do that. So if you recall, yesterday we described this uh, quarter circle region in rectangular coordinates. We had to go from left to right, from bottom to top. From left to right, and if we, when we did x from uh, last, from left to right, we went from negative three to zero. Then y went from the bottom at zero to the top, that positive square root. Then when we went to the, dy, the dx dy integral, Y went from zero to three, that's the bottom to the top. And then left to right was the circle on the left, or the quarter circle on the left, but the negative part of it up to zero. So we describe this region with these two uh, double integrals.
What we want to think about now is how we would describe this region in polar coordinates. We're going to do the same thing. What's R between and what's theta between? What's R between and what's theta between? So if we look at the R's, if we pick a typical value of theta, R starts here at the pole and the R always goes out to Down here at the pole is where R is equal to zero. And this is a quarter of a circle. So all the points on that edge of the circle are three units away from the origin. So R goes from zero to three. We also need to think about what theta is between. If we put theta in standard position, this vertical up here, this is when theta is equal to pi over two or 90 degrees. And then we've got to cover all the way down to this negative x axis where theta is pi. So this piece of a circle is just what two intervals look like in polar coordinates. In rectangular coordinates, two intervals look like rectangles. In polar coordinates, two intervals look like pieces of circles. So everything looks pretty straightforward until we point out there's going to be a problem. So when we look at these two double integrals in polar coordinates, they, everything seems simple enough. We did the same thing. What's R between, what's theta between, just like what's X between and what's Y between. But here's the problem. And these integrals up here, dx and dy, both represent length. Or length and width, you want to call them different things. Down here, dr is a length, but d theta is a change in angle, not a length. D theta is a change in angle, not a change in length.
up here when we had dy and dx, dx was some little change in length and dy was some little change in length. Oh, I don't need to write dy twice. And that gave us an area. But there's a problem down here. D theta is not a length, it's an angle. dr is a length. But d theta is an angle. In the rectangular coordinates, dA was dx dy. Area is equal to length times width. Up here, everything was fine. dA is length times width. But down here, I can't just write dA is equal to dr d theta or d theta dr. d theta is not a length. When we write d theta dr, it doesn't say length times width. So d theta dr is not a length times width. So dA is not an area. Fortunately for our hero, there's a simple way around that. And all I have to do is explain to you how to turn dA into an area by turning d theta into a length. And if I do that now, then all of calculus will be super simple. But you could tell by the tone of my voice and the fact that I'm saying these particular words that it must be nine o'clock because I'm not going to be telling you this today which means I had to tell my BS story from earlier, even though it's true that I get, uh, it's like mid semester slump, because I wanted to make sure that we hit nine o'clock before I told you how to turn DA into an area. So this is what I want you to do. How do we turn DA into an area? How do we turn D theta into a length? D theta is an angle, and we need to turn that angle into a length. Finding this length is your character arc for tomorrow. That's gonna to do it for today. And we will try to solve our problem for your character, your character arc tomorrow. And hopefully it wouldn't take too much length. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you all on tomorrow. Good have a good day and thanks for playing.